World War II took a heavy toll on the people of the world, but especially the British people. Once Adolf Hitler decided that he wanted to make war upon Great Britain in 1939, the German dictator began Operation Sea Lion or the invasion of the island nation. With constant attacks taking place with nightly bombings of Great Britain's main cities, nations around the world watching the destruction through news media outlets and newsreels believed that the British people would soon relent. However, Hitler misjudged the resilience of those people and eventually surrendered in his quest to prepare for an amphibious invasion. During this period of time, when blackouts were necessary to avoid the targeting by German bombers flying over the country at night, it became a criminal's dream. Even after the Germans gave up on the planned invasion, British officials continued with the blackouts as sporadic bombing raids still occurred. One perpetrator, in particular, sought the cover of darkness provided in the name of safety for British citizens to commit the most horrid of crimes, uninhibited destruction of human life. On February 9, 1942, an electrician on his way to work spotted a flashlight, or torch in the local vernacular, lying on the ground outside of an air raid shelter in Montague Place within the Maribyrn District. Seeing something suspicious, the electrician and his companion looked inside of the shelter and noted the body of Evelyn Hamilton, aged 40 or 42, lying on her back in the gutter. Hamilton's skirt had been raised up and her undergarments exposed. The medical examiner noted she had been strangled and her handbag proved missing. The medical examiner could find no evidence of sexual assault. Investigators believed the killer murdered Hamilton somewhere else and then disposed of the body during the blackout. Hamilton had worked at a pharmacy and investigators theorized that Hamilton may have been on the street near the air raid shelter or the killer discovered her alone within the shelter and chose her as a victim of opportunity. On February 10, 1942, in an apartment on Warder Street in the Soho District, two meter readers discovered the body of 35-year-old Evelyn Oatley. Oatley, sadly, had resorted to prostitution and used the assumed name of Nita Ward, but she aspired to one day become an actress. When the meter readers made their way into the apartment, they noticed a flashlight sticking out of the woman's body from between her legs, her head hanging over the edge of the bed, and blood strewn all over the floor. Even though her cause of death had been listed as strangulation, Oakley also sustained a deep throat wound that the medical examiner believed the killer used a very sharp knife to inflict the injury. Moreover, it appeared the killer became more brazen and sexually assaulted Oatley with a can opener. Investigators lucked out when they found the instrument not too far away from the apartment, stained with Oatley's blood. Additionally, investigators discovered a set of fingerprints on the handle of that can opener. Margaret Florence Lowe, also known as Pearl, approximately aged 42 or 43 at the time, was a widow with a 15-year-old child. Because her daughter's boarding school had a lot of fees, Lowe took to prostitution in order to maintain that her daughter received a good education. On February 12, 1942, when Lowe's mother came for a visit to spend the weekend with her daughter at their Gosfield Street apartment, she knocked at the door and received no answer. When the police arrived at the apartment, they kicked down the door and discovered the horrific scene. The medical examiner noted that Lowe had been strangled and then her body had been mutilated with both a knife and a razor and the murder took place the night before. The medical examiner, Bernard Spilsbury, stated that the murderer was a savage sexual maniac. The chief inspector on the case, Edward Greeno of Scotland Yard's murder squad, thought the same killer perpetrated the Hamilton and Oatley murders. The fingerprints identified the killer as left-handed and they came from the same person. Spilsbury did make an assumption that proved obvious the same killer was responsible for both the Oakley and Lowe's murders. When authorities raised the alarm about a possible killer on the loose, on February 12, 1942, Mary Haywood sat in a pub when a young man approached. He bought Haywood a few drinks and propositioned her by throwing some money on the table. Haywood stated to the young man that she was not that kind of girl. The two then left the pub and walked into the street. Once the two passed a dark doorway, the young man kissed her and then put his hands up her skirt. When Haywood again told the man no, he proceeded to strangle her. Haywood fought back, but eventually she passed out. Luckily, a night porter passed the doorway and the young man fled. 
In his escape, the perpetrator left something that would cause a break in the case, a respirator with a Royal Air Force number 525987 printed in the device. That same night, the young man found a sex worker, Catherine Mulcahy, and he charmed her enough for Mulcahy to invite the young man back to her apartment. When the two got into bed, the young man strangled Mulcahy. She kicked him in the stomach and he retreated when she screamed, alerting the neighbors that something was amiss. The young man threw money at Mulcahy as he fled the apartment. The apparently unsatisfied bloodlust bubbled and gurgled within the young man and he finally found another victim. This time he would not be denied. Doris Genouet, aged 32 to 40, lived in a two-room ground floor apartment located in the Paddington district she shared with her husband. Her husband returned home on February 13th and discovered her body. Genouet was known to pick up servicemen in Leicester Square and bring them back to the apartment where her body was found. The medical examiner determined that Genouet had been strangled with a scarf and her body appeared to have been sexually mutilated with a razor. After the murder of Doris Genouet, both Mary Haywood and Catherine Mulcahy approached the authorities about their attacks and identified a Royal Air Force airman as their assailant. But a connection between the Blackout Ripper, as the media dubbed him, and the attacks came from the respirator with the identifying number. The police determined that the mask found at the scene of Haywood's attack was assigned to airman Gordon Cummins. The police took the wayward serviceman into custody for questioning. Described as good-looking, well-educated, and from a good family, Cummins was born on February 18, 1914, in York, England. Cummins maintained that he was the illegitimate son of a member of the British peerage, and friends jokingly called him the Count. Not much is known about his earlier life until approximately 1939, where, unable to keep and hold a job, Cummins joined the Royal Air Force. As a handsome, well-built man, Cummins married a young woman, but continued to engage with prostitutes in some of the poorer neighborhoods of London. In addition to his proclivities with sex workers, Cummins also stole small articles from his conquests. Some believed that Cummins had suddenly snapped and began killing at this time. What caused the mental break, history does not record. Cummins believed that the blackout served to conceal his nocturnal activities, at least until he dropped his respirator during the attack of Mary Haywood. During his questioning on February 16, 1942, the police found Cummins to be evasive and arrogant. With the suspect in custody, they searched his lodgings and found a pen engraved with Doris Genoway's initials, a cigarette case Barbara Lowe identified as her mother's, and another cigarette case belonging to Evelyn Oatley. Authorities also found a blood-stained shirt and the money he threw at Catherine Mulcahy had been traced to his pay records. Fingerprints tied Cummins to the can opener used to mutilate Evelyn Oatley and a glass found in Margaret Lowe's apartment and mortar dust similar to that found in the air raid shelter where Evelyn Hamilton met her killer matched the dust within Cummins' respirator. Authorities knew they had their man and Cummins continued to act arrogantly and evasively until he was formally charged with the murder of Evelyn Oatley. Cummins' trial for Oatley's murder began on April 25, 1942 and took only 35 minutes. Chief Superintendent Fred Cheryl, a fingerprint expert at the time, solidly convinced the jury that Cummins did, indeed, murder Evelyn Oatley with malice aforethought. On April 28, 1942, the judge sentenced Cummins to be hanged by the neck until he was dead. Even until the moment of his execution, Cummins pled his innocence with no sense of arrogance he displayed all but gone. On June 25, 1942, during an air raid, the executioner carried out the sentence of the court and Cummins died at the end of a rope. In studying this case, History portrays Gordon Frederick Cummins as more brutal as his predecessor, Jack the Ripper. Cummins defiled the bodies without any other rhyme or reason than to destroy a living being. But why? Why does someone who allegedly had a wonderful career ahead of him suddenly snap and commit the most horrid acts? 
This is a question that most subscribers ask with every story presented here on True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. And so, the study of criminal psychology continues. <laughs>